Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we continue our analysis of planetary nebula. In the last two videos on this topic, a new understanding of planetary nebula was presented. In the first of these, the presence of forbidden lines in such objects was reviewed. Historically, such lines were used to theorize that planetary nebula must be both gaseous and hypodense. But in reality, careful study demonstrated that forbidden lines could be produced when atoms or ions were subjected to elevated densities or when they were in contact with or contained within condensed matter. In the second video, this point was further expanded and detailed condensation reactions were presented to account for virtually all the principal emission lines observed in planetary nebula. In the end, nothing should be regarded as random when it comes to the spectra of such objects. Rather, their complex spectra reveal something relative to the chemical processes taking place in planetary nebula. This includes the presence of condensed matter at the site of emission. In the second video, the standard account for the presence of forbidden lines in planetary nebula was presented. In this model, a central star must first photoionize hydrogen or helium. The resulting electrons are then used to ionize other atoms, therefore giving rise to virtually all the forbidden lines. A schematic representation of this idea is presented in this figure. It is argued that very near the star, the density of high energy photons will allow effective ionization of certain species that will not be ionized further from the star. This leads to the concept of stratification of radiation. The problem is that such concepts are much too primitive to have any real merit and simply cannot account for actual spectroscopic observations. For example, it is well known that X-ray emissions from planetary nebula are not localized near the central star, but arise from greatly extended sources, as one can learn in this paper. Therefore, we must be dealing with local phenomena and the presence of condensed matter which has nothing to do with the central star, as I had previously outlined. To further strengthen the point, examine these images from IC4663 which are said to confirm stratification of radiation arguments. Clearly, the two elliptical components displayed on these images should not exist if a central star was determining the ionization. Rather, one should obtain spherical symmetry. Furthermore, note that in the Argon 5 image on the lower right, one of the ellipses is much brighter than the other. Once again, this points to locally dominated phenomena, as I highlighted in the previous video. A central star cannot be responsible for this ionization, and this provides clear evidence refuting the claim. Rather, the central star first ejected the material. The luminosity of this material was then maintained and driven by local processes. Next, have a look at these three images from the same paper illustrating electron temperature maps obtained using three ions, namely the forbidden lines from oxygen-3 and nitrogen-2 and an allowed line from helium-1. Note how the central portion of the nitrogen-2 image is reflecting temperatures of about 30,000 Kelvin, but in the helium image, temperatures of less than 7,500 Kelvin are indicated for the same region. Clearly, these temperatures cannot be real, and this is a sure sign that chemistry and not random processes are guiding the formation of ions in these regions. Next, consider these four images from NGC 7662. Once again, the nitrogen-2 image on the lower right highlights that emission lines in planetary nebula must be dominated by local phenomena. Beyond these concerns, the major problem for the standard model of planetary nebula is the difficulty in accounting for the complex shapes of such objects if everything hinges on a gaseous central star. Just have a look at all these wonderful images of planetary nebula. These images are filled with structure. But how does one build structure if everything must be constructed from a gas or a gaseous plasma? In an attempt to resolve this problem, astronomers now invoke that a large percentage of planetary nebula, perhaps as much as 60 to 70 percent, 
have binary stars at their center, which are extremely close and orbiting one another. They use models of such orbiting stars to construct their nebular structures. Of course, given enough computing power, anything can be rationalized using theory. The question is, do any of these models actually have any bearing on reality? Along these lines, though astronomers now require binaries to build up their nebular structure, these are never visual binaries. In the work by Ms. Zalke et al., they argue against such binaries in this way. Visual binaries are not directly comparable to our sample because their influence on nebular shaping is expected to be less dramatic than closed binaries. They are saying that in order to have sufficient ability to shape the nebula, binary stars must be very close to one another. As a result, only one central star is ever observed. The other is merely hypothesized to be present. In the end, Mizalski et al. examined a total of 33 planetary nebula for closed binary central stars. The orbital periods involved for most of these object pairs are clearly unreasonable, with values as low as 0.14 days or just 3.5 hours. Imagine, now we have two stars orbiting around one another in just three and a half hours. In fact, out of 33 planetary nebula, only eight have periods for their central binaries of more than one day, the longest two periods being of only seven and 16 days. Despite the unreasonableness of such claims, the search for short period binaries continues undeterred, as evidenced by these papers. Of course, ultimately, the goal is to account for the structure of planetary nebula. So what is the primary basis for the existence of primaries at the center of nebula? The evidence rests on the detection of variability in the emission of the observed central star within the nebula. However, such emission variability should hardly come as a surprise since these stars are unstable enough to produce the nebula in the first place. But remember that in the standard model, all stars are gaseous in nature. This makes it nearly impossible to account for variable emission. As a result, when variability is observed in a star, astronomers are quick to claim that they have discovered a new exoplanet, for instance, or in the case of planetary nebula, that a closed binary star must be present. So let us have a look at an example of the variability which can be observed for central stars of planetary nebula. We begin with the necklace planetary nebula shown here. This image is a composite assembled from the hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen lines. Isn't this a beautiful nebula? Note how there are structures well removed from the central star in the necklace portion of this object. Clearly the emission from these regions cannot be derived from a central star. In any event, at the center of the nebula there is a bright central star which is highly variable in its emission, as one can see in this figure. In this case, the observation was performed using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey I-band at 762.5 nanometers in the near-infrared. Note how the I-band magnitude of this star is changing dramatically with a period of only 1.16 days. Astronomers account for this variability by adding an orbiting star around the central star. Of course, this second star is never seen. It is just theorized to be present because of the variability of the central star. Again, what is so surprising about an unstable star at the center of a planetary nebula having varying luminosity? Nothing whatsoever. One does not need a second unseen star to account for the luminosity changes. Now besides the changes in luminosity, changes in spectra are also explained by adding a second star. As an example, look at this figure taken from Polacco and Bell. These astronomers claim that the principal spectrum with the strong absorption lines in helium-2, hydrogen gamma, hydrogen beta, and nitrogen-5 is due to the central star. The inset above the principal spectrum is said to represent the emission lines from the orbiting secondary star. Here is a plot displaying how the signals from the primary star in the solid dots are changing relative to the signals from the secondary star. From this data, they even measure the mass and radius of each star. Wow, that seems just too good to be true, and in fact it is. 
Nothing in this data provides convincing evidence that a second star is even present. Rather, it is much more likely that the central star is simply undergoing rapid phase changes as it crosses from one region of a phase diagram into another. To help everyone better understand the importance of phase diagrams, consider the phase diagram for ice. This comes from a paper entitled The Everlasting Hunt for New Ice Phases. Different regions of this diagram correspond to different lattice structures in ice. One can see that a very small displacement on the phase diagram can result in completely different structures for ice. This is something that is well known for every inorganic chemist. Now consider the hydrogen phase diagram. Note that in this diagram there are several question marks. That is because no one really knows what the correct phase diagram for hydrogen might look like. We have ideas, but we cannot be certain of what structures exactly exist in what regions. There could be many regions that we do not even suspect exist. That was why we discussed the water phase diagram. So what if we consider a hypothetical section of a phase diagram for the surface material of a star at the center of a planetary nebula? This diagram might be based on hydrogen mostly, but other elements might come into play, especially if the star is not on the main sequence. Now we have this hypothetical section of a phase diagram. The double arrow shows that transitions can readily occur between two regions of the diagram based solely on temperature. One can assume that the region existing at higher temperatures has structure 1 and also has a higher emissivity. Conversely, one can assume that structure 2 exists at lower temperatures and has lower emissivity. Next, consider what might be happening in an unstable star. When the star's photosphere adopts structure 2, it would have a lowered emissivity and would have difficulty dissipating heat through emission. As a result, the temperature of the material would slowly rise over time. When the phase boundary is reached, a change in structure could occur over the entire photosphere, and now emissivity would go up as a result of new lattice structure, structure 1. Consequently, the stellar surface begins to cool again, and now the star eventually readopts structure 2. As a result of all this, the star could be oscillating between one structure and another. The emissivities differ, so the oscillation exactly mimics what might be imagined if two stars are orbiting one another. The clear advantage of this hypothesis is that a rapid change in phase can easily be envisioned and one does not require stars to orbit one another at enormous velocities. Along these lines, have a look at this communication relative to rapid phase transitions in the laboratory and the ability to move from the insulating state to the metallic state with the application of just a couple of pulses of laser light. Then there is this paper referring to rapid phase oscillations under infrared light. These two examples serve to highlight that rapid phase transitions are known to exist in the laboratory. It can be asserted that rapid phase transitions can also extend to the stars. As for spectral changes, a change in underlying emissivity in structure 2 might reduce the continuous spectrum of the star to such an extent that the absorption lines are no longer seen. We are left with a few remaining emission lines. Alternatively, the star might actually have two distinct surfaces in different regions. An example of this has been proposed for a white dwarf star, which is said to present two separate faces as it rotates. One face is dominated by hydrogen absorption lines, the other by helium absorption lines. The problem with this particular star is that the period of rotation is simply too fast, at around 15 minutes. This leads one to believe that there are actually not two distinct surfaces on this star, but that, once again, astronomers are simply observing oscillations between differing structures on the photosphere of this object. The idea that a star could be oscillating between two different crystal structures on its surface has interesting consequences in another area of astrophysics, namely the search for exoplanets. For instance, the TRAPPIST-1 system is said to contain seven planets as seen in this table. However, all these planet characteristics 
were derived based on the idea that the light curve of the star itself was being affected only by the planets. Yet what if the entire variation in the stellar light curve was completely explained by oscillations within the phase diagram of the star? That would have absolutely nothing to do with exoplanets, and TRAPPIST-1 might not actually be home to any such objects. In any case, given the very short orbital period of all these supposed planets from 1.5 to 19 days, perhaps these ideas need to be reconsidered. After all, the orbital periods in our own solar system range from about 87 days for Mercury and 165 years for Neptune. In any event, too much is being extracted from a single light curve in the case of TRAPPIST-1, including orbital periods, masses, radii, surface gravities, inclinations, and temperatures of all the exoplanets. This constitutes a sure sign of overreaching in science. In my opinion, most of the papers relative to the presence of planets around TRAPPIST-1 should have been rejected. We have all been enticed by computer models which could be completely detached from the truth. It remains a reality that most of the exoplanets identified using transit methods have extremely short orbital periods, with many ranging from just a few hours to a few days. This fact brings into question whether or not we are really seeing an exoplanet or just witnessing normal stellar variability caused by photospheric phase transitions. You can see many of these exoplanet candidates on the NASA Exoplanet Archives hosted at Caltech. Or, to see exoplanets identified by their transit, you can go to this link. Of course, the direct visualization of orbiting exoplanets around a star provides solid evidence for their existence, and here is an example. Finally, spectroscopic shifts on spectra can provide reasonably solid evidence for the existence of an exoplanet, but again, caution should be exercised. In the end, I hope that everyone was able to grasp a few key points from this video. First, it is extremely unlikely that central stars are controlling ionization in planetary nebula. Rather, we must be dealing with local phenomena. Secondly, the idea that central binary stars can be responsible for the structure of planetary nebula actually points to a tremendous weakness in the standard model. Deprived of condensed matter ejection from a central star, those accepting modern theory must try to weave structure into a gas. The problem is solved when one recognizes that stars are formed from condensed matter, which can be ejected. Thirdly, it is clear that the central stars of planetary nebula should be unstable objects. That is why planetary nebula exist in the first place. As a result, one does not need close binaries to account for variability in the star's luminosity or spectra. Movement in the phase diagram can easily explain everything, and that occurs only when stars are recognized as comprised of condensed matter. Fourth, it is likely that many exoplanets discovered on the basis of luminosity variability are not exoplanets at all, but rather just simple manifestations of a star's transition within its phase diagram. Therefore, we need to rethink the existence of many exoplanets. Well, that is all for today. Next time, we will examine p signi profiles in the ultraviolet spectrum of planetary nebula and discuss this in the context of p signi stars. So stay tuned for an exciting episode. But for now, if you enjoyed the video, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Scientific comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on the next video.